Welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies to dive headfirst into some nostalgia or just get a little creative. So every month, we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email to screenrefresh at gmail.com. Let us know what your top three are or suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean and Nick. Oh, Nick usually goes first. Bonjour. Hello there. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're getting a little childish with our favorite childhood cartoons. Cue music. As far as today, we're going to be getting into childhood cartoons. I I don't know about you guys. I had a little bit of difficulty with this just because I didn't know in my own head when I should do the cutoff in terms of times. Because should I do childhood cartoons of ones I actually watched when I was like young, young? Or if it's all the ones I watched in like the, the middle school and on era? I feel like my life was split into very distinct time frames. Like, once I learned about Toonami on Cartoon Network and prior to Toonami and Cartoon Network. Yeah, I feel like my cartoon experience was... The heaviest cartoon stuff was, like, very young. I kind of fell off of cartoons, like, as serious viewing experiences, I feel like, at a certain point. Well, I feel like it was a time frame of there is either the, the early morning cartoons during like your Nick Jr. days, then he kind of transitioned to all the Saturday morning cartoons. And then as the older I got, it turned into all of the Cartoon Network, like three o'clock to seven o'clock cartoons, all of that, like post school break stuff. I broke it down to just the ones I wanted to talk about the most. That's probably a good, <laughs> a good system. Because I mean, it's, I mean, realistically, like, yeah, I can list off like 15, 20 different cartoons, too, that I watched growing up as a kid. But like, I don't really want to talk about some of them because we've already talked about a few of them already. Or just yeah. like, how many times am I going to go over Gargoyles? I, I, Yeah, it's a number one contender for me, but I'm not going to pick it because I already talked about it. We're trying to do more stuff, you know? Yeah. And plus, I don't care when it comes to lists. It's not like... My three choices here are my definitive choices, and that's it, you know? And like, oh, he never, he didn't mention this thing. Like, there's there's a lot more. We, I feel we grew up in, like, one of the last big hurrahs when it came to, like, cartoons and stuff. Like, oh, the yeah. Saturday morning cartoons and just everything else in general. Because I don't really, I mean, I'm out of touch. But when it comes to the newest generation of watching shows and stuff like all our cartoons were catered to selling toys and shit so we had a ton of things coming at us every other week when it comes to some kind of new advertising television show and there's just so many that yeah we practically watched all of them you know well plus i think with the the growth of streaming all the kids nowadays it's not you don't need to get up on a saturday morning it's not like you're after school kind of things it's there's shows popping up on netflix that hey here's a new cartoon for you to watch and here's the entire season of like 22 episodes and you can just sit down and just watch all of them that i i don't know if it just means that they have content more readily available or if it just means that there's more difficulty in finding the quality content in there because it's I watch some stuff, but I feel like I definitely don't have my finger to the pulse of modern cartoons for children, more so animated series for older crowds. Actually, uh, Saturday morning cartoons don't exist anymore as a block. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah they stopped um, it like I'm not a couple sure. Years ago. Did Soul Train finally take over from <laughs> 7 to noon? No, funnily enough, <laughs> um, my, I'm going to say industry, my, my job, the company I work for, makes they educational content yeah they stopped it <laughs> single-handedly the big networks i mean it was a government mandate about required weekly educational programming that's um, what monday through friday was for <laughs> <laughs> jesus give us and the fucking weekend so i i don't know the exact reason but like the shows i work on now air uh saturday mornings and there's like sports and like the networks just decided 
here's where our programming's going. I don't know why. It must have also been a viewership thing. You know, if kids maybe just weren't watching, maybe they're watching YouTube instead of waking up and watching cartoons, and they're just like, yeah, well, let's put all of our educational stuff here now. Yeah, unless they were just seeing a case of less kids tuning in, which means the money was being wasted on, like, ad time and things like that. Yeah. Of, eh. I noticed kids don't losses. play with toys nearly as much as we used to also. Yeah. I think that's something to do with it. Which, I mean, it's great that all of the new, like, overtime technology of now I know, like, there are kids who have VR headsets. Like, kids early on in their life get, like, an iPad or stuff. And it's cool, like, because then there's a lot of kids who get into different things, like kids who got into coding at an early age or kids who got into, like, other things because of their access to technology. But I kind of still always will miss the opportunity to sit down and just, like, play with some action figures. I mean, I, I'd never pass that opportunity up today. Yeah, but, Dean, you play with them and it's still in the box. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Not true for most of them. Dean, I see a box. Raphael from here. Listen, I have nowhere to put him. That's why he's stacked on a box near my desk. My shelves are filled. I need to create more space for myself. And then I'll let them breathe, as they say. Um, you mean deplete their value? <laughs> no, see, I have magic tape, and I'll just I'll just reseal it. Say, yeah, it's never opened. <laughs> I get all my what toys. I get all my like toys the... out like the uh, toy repairman in Toy Story Two. <laughs> That's what, that what you're about to say. say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put on it's steroid gloves. I go into a clean room and I just clean them. And yeah, it'll be a process. What Mama don't know won't hurt her. So, top childhood cartoons. Do either of you want to go first? Or do you want me to take first at plate? So, my first choice is actually a really oldie, but goldie, and it's um, Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes are Nickelodeon! With you anyway. Technically, Ooh, technically Tiny Toons, but they kind of go hand in hand with each other. Wait, what? Yeah. That's the that's completely different. Well, I mean, you had Looney Tunes characters cameoing in, which it's funny to say cameoing for a cartoon. Yeah. But you had like the Looney Tunes characters cameo. showing up. Because I think, what? Do they really? Um, Did they Yeah, because yeah, I think show? Buster and Babs, mm -hmm. um, like Bugs was their uncle or something like that. Professor. Professor. Oh. Because they went to Acme University, and all of the OG Looney Tunes were the teachers. Oh. At Acme University to get a tune to... Now I remember that. Yeah. That, like, specifically Tiny Tunes, I think was a show that entertained kids, but also was well-written enough to appreciate as an adult now, too. It was kind of like a predecessor to Animaniacs. And that's definitely more of an adult cartoon than anything else. I never yeah. got into Animaniacs or any of the um, later uh, cartoons that the Warner Brothers did. I mean, I appreciate them. It's just I never truly got into it. I like Animaniacs. I mean, everyone knows Looney Tunes. They're, you know, came from like the 30s. Um, there's a lot of history to Looney Tunes that's worthy of its own kind of screen refresh episode. You know, between changing hands, producers, writers through the years, and to finally what it just evolved into of what we know of today. But at least, you know, went into syndication in the 50s, um, eventually would find itself on Nickelodeon. That's where I started watching it. I remember watching Looney Tunes when I was a really young kid, but the one that really stood out the most was when it evolved into the spin off series Tiny Tunes in 1990. That was produced by Spielberg. And as we uh, mentioned before, that's where all the original tunes were teachers at Acme University and all the younger generation of tunes took the spotlight. And it all had like a bunch of like instead of Porky Pig, it was um, Hampton. Instead of um, Daffy Duck, it was Plucky. Uh, Plucky. I was just talking about this with somebody the other day, but do you remember Foulmouth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that... <laughs> gum this was, and gum was... that. For instance, take Foulmouth, please. He's been mooning over Shirley the Loon for weeks. He'd love to ask her out. But Foulmouth has just one little problem. Ah, uh, 
when I spilled milk all over my penis. Did I say little problem? I was talking to somebody. I'm like, I swear there's a Tiny Toons episode or character where like they bleep swearing. Like some, like the character just like continuously swears. What if I had a nickel for every time I spilled some of my clothes and be a rich guy? I don't. Some of the yeah. shit, like one of my choices, especially, I feel like some of the shit that they got away with. Like putting on TV for kids, I was I couldn't believe it. Falmouth swears so much his beak has been declared a toxic waste dump. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, Robert Paulson that did Falmouth. What was his name? Robert Paulson was that it? <laughs> <laughs> his name was Robert Paulson. <laughs> his name was Robert Paulson. I think Tiny Toons, like even aside from Looney Tunes, I remember growing up and like watching Cartoon Network when I would visit my grandparents, and they would split up the Looney Tunes. By era of creator, it would be like the the Chuck Jones Looney Tunes or like all of these other things or like Tex Avery um, of all these different cartoon eras, which was super cool because, I mean, it's the same equivalent now of having the same characters in a comic book, but having different writers have their run and seeing how different it is from group to group. But the big thing with Tiny Toons that I liked is it was very self-aware. It had them not only like making references to movies pop culture of the time of the past and then also you have them meeting and encountering like steven spielberg and other in-universe characters that it kind of blended all of this together to make it a little meta before meta was kind of a big thing i guess at the time my favorite thing of theirs was when they did that um made for tv special how he spent my summer vacation oh yes <laughs> We're waiting for the clock to strike three. When it's three o'clock, we'll be free. Then it's adios, university. Summertime is coming, finally. That I must have seen dozens of times. Tiny Tunes? Yep. I don't remember that. Yeah, um... I just remember somebody with, like, a, a hockey mask and a chainsaw or something like that. Because they pick up the hitchhiker. Babs and... Buster were oh, off yeah. doing their He's own thing. And then Plucky went with Hampton on his family to go to some really big theme park, but they did cross country in their car the entire time. And he was miserable through the whole drive. And then they get there to the theme park and they're there for like 20 seconds and then they leave. And he's like, what? <laughs> I think Foul House goes this. on a date. Seeing that hitchhiker, I'm like, oh yeah, I definitely recall that. The image of that, like he's like brain dead, like, like, he just was like, uh. yeah, like the, <laughs> and the then he has a mask on. I remember from Tiny Toons are all of their horror parodies, like having the <laughs> hitchhiker in that, or um, when was it the the Nightmare on Elm Street thing with I think Plucky and Hampton, where they watch the movie before they go to bed, and they have like the Freddy Krueger analog chasing after him. <laughs> Cougars, the best movie monster ever. But yeah, I, Tiny Toons and Leaner Toons, I think, hand in hand. Is there Perfect. Jurassic, I think there's some Jurassic Park references in Tiny Toons. Oh, oh I'm definitely. Sure. It, uh, Spielberg produced a cartoon in the early 90s. But it was WB, they... different studio, but um, I, unless it's a different cartoon I'm thinking of, I don't know. It might be a different t cartoon. I just remember Ian Malcolm. I cartoonized Ian Malcolm. It, it's the Warner Brothers. And the Warner that's, yeah, that, oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He did it, uh, that, 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 that crazy son of a gun actually did it. I think a raptor like driving a Jeep. I don't know. I don't know what cartoon that was. Right into now this list. Now I want to go back and watch Tiny Toons for all these. It's one of my favorites growing up. I haven't really rewatched any of it. I think I tried watching the Summer Vacation skit a couple of years ago, but I wasn't really paying attention to it. And it was a lot harder to get than I expected. Yeah. There's nowhere to watch it. Good luck trying to find a VHS tape of it, too. Yeah, I know certain ones like during from that time, like Animaniacs. When Animaniacs had the reboot, they started putting that one back on Hulu and whatnot. So I don't know which ones in, from that time are available now, but I'd be willing to try to find Tiny Toons again just to check it out. I think it, it I'm almost positive it's going to hold up because I feel like the writing was good enough at the time that it's not going to feel hokey. So, very good picnic. What did you just say? 
picnic. <laughs> Damn it, so I Dean said I wasn't going to laugh anymore. If you want to go last, I'll go up next then. No, I'm going so, next. So, starting yeah, get, from an early age, last. there was a show I used to watch in, on Nick Jr. starting in uh, November of 1995 called Little Bear, created by uh, Maurice Sendak, based on the, the book of Maurice Sendak Illustrated. And uh, Else Minerick uh, wrote, I believe. But the, the whole thing, for anybody unfamiliar, is just the little bear and his family and then his friends like Chicken and Duck and all of this um, and the human girl. And it was just like his adventures day to day. It was usually like a half hour episode and they had three short stories in each of them. And it was, I feel like by the time it came out, I was already, I think, like six so I wasn't quite like aging out of that demographic, but I was on the the higher end, I guess, for that, for the the Nick Jr. demographic. But for some reason, it still stuck with me over time. And it was always had like a calming presence just because it was very an innocuous show. The like the minimalist usage of music in Little Bear, uh, Leslie Barber did the the score for it. But the whole thing was just fun kind of whimsical music but it's always used minimally so it always has this kind of odd feel to the show that just cements it in time of like that mid 90s nick jr fame i didn't know what you're talking about old, until huh? i until i googled it and then the poster i'm like oh okay i immediately remember this show yeah i do remember but i thought it was i didn't realize it was it started in the mid 90s yeah well it felt like it was a newer show I am. We are older than you, though, so there's going to be a slight mismatch in that sweet spot of cartoons, like what was like at top at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember watching this, but yeah, it came out November six, ninety five, and ran until two thousand three. I definitely wasn't watching around two thousand three, but I, oh, I no, mean, yeah, I'm sure, like you know, you stay home from school or something, you put the TV on, and it's just that's the only thing on TV, so you'll watch it. I yeah, watch a lot of wear Blue's Clues bear. that way, and like Gullah Gullah Island. I didn't go uh, Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. I was not the demographic for that television no. show. but no, I remember not. freshman year of college, <laughs> I found out that one of the networks we had would play Gullah Gullah Island from like 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., and I set my DVR, but then I forgot about it, and then, like, remembered six months later when all of a sudden my roommate tried to record something. There was, like, DVRs full. And it was just episode after episode of Gullah Gullah Island. <laughs> I just imagine the future. Such a that's good like show. A, the DVR is a collect. You sell that as it's a selling point. Like, it has all episodes of Gullah Gullah <laughs> Island. Starting bid, $2,000. <laughs> that's a treasure trove, man. There are some shows that, like, yeah, we're not the demographic for it, but they, they're they pretty solid. Yeah. I like that one. Benya, Benya. Benya, Benya. I remember watching Arthur a lot. Didn't care for it, but, I mean, I watched it enough that you would think I liked it. <laughs> it was that sister, man. I always wanted to smack DW with the biggest fucking hammer. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you see... You see the sister, and it just cuts to your fist clenching. Oh my god! Like I fully get it, man. Arthur, I, I got, I got your back, man. Yeah, she was like a know-it-all. Nick, you're too, or uh, Tim, you're too, you're too young for Eureka's Castle, right? You don't remember? No, that, do you? I remember Eureka's really? Castle. Do you? Yeah. With Quagmire, okay. and I had all the toys Eureka. for Eureka's Castle. Well, there were yeah, to Eureka. Oh, there were toys. Yeah, there were toys. Okay. I kind of want to call you out on that because <laughs> I barely remember eureka's castle and i was young you had to have gone back oh no yeah i it wasn't like on reruns yeah it was reruns when okay. i was young they had reruns yeah shit that thing didn't leave mike after three years old that shit never came back that was like a fever it was, dream it was originally up. during like the early 90s damn 89 to 91 and that was its original run and then it's just i think recycled. it's because during the early 90s Nick was still getting its sea legs of like it had content, but it didn't have the level of content it did in the like mid to late 90s. So there was a lot of stuff that it was pulling from like other stations or Canada or like the late 80s and then rerunning it during times. So that's how I found Eureka's Castle. No shit. Yeah, because I always wanted to watch reruns. At this point, I'm way too old for it. But I remember growing up, kind of struck me like oh yeah i remember this and trying to find it was an impossibility 
and after leaving my early childhood i never seen it again i think it was like early youtube clips someone uploaded watching the intro again i'm like holy shit i remember this yeah i don't <laughs> think i've watched eureka's castle since oh my god there's a giant in the beginning mm-hmm. that's I don't want to get off too off topic because that's not a cartoon, but I was just on the subject of like... Is Eureka's Castle your number three? <laughs> really bending the rules here. Is it David the Gnome and Todd Bosley? Uh, David the Gnome is excellent. <laughs> and I th- considered putting it on. So did I. I kind of left out early, like Nick Jr. early era. Oh, before you had more refined tastes? Yes, exactly. Like I really... Muppet, for some reason, before we even had this topic, like Muppet Babies came up in my life a lot recently. Oh, yeah. That theme song. All oh, the theme songs. I mean, they, that was just like a magical time. Like, I, I mean, I'm sure everybody has their theme, theme songs from being a kid, but like, I could still, like, uh, what Nick's pick, Tiny Toon Adventures. I hadn't watched that show since I was a kid, and I just played the theme song a little bit ago, yep. and it's like, I, I know all the words, but I know exactly how it goes. Like, I... It just didn't leave my head. That's crazy. Well, as soon as he was like, well, no, Bugs Bunny was the professor because they went to Acme University. And then in my head, it immediately went through the rest of the lyrics and the rest of the music. And it's like, they're oh, tiny, they're tiny. It's all they're unlocked. All a little loony. I was going to say, just like, you know, it's funny how The Witcher has one of the fastest intros and I always want to skip it. But when it comes to these childhood shows, I'm willing to watch that entire minute and a half intro segment. And it's the same thing every episode, but I'm willing to watch that over a 10 second clip for Witcher. I feel like sometimes when I'm nostalgic for a show or cartoon, I don't even search for the entire episode. I just search for like the intro and I watch it and ah, ah, that was great. And then I go back to what I'm doing after 10 seconds. That's all you need. It's like a junkie fix. Do, do the bears, are the bears foragers vegetarians on little bear did they ever did they eat salmon or anything uh meat eaters yeah they it was terrible because watching a clip to refresh i just you see the mom and it's just a bear just in a, a dress and it's just like it just had this image of her going out and like eating a deer <laughs> but it doesn't the tone doesn't change it's like totally normal she's just like eating with like blood on her face and it's like oh little bear how are you how are you doing this morning <laughs> I don't know or if she, that'd be more no, she, disturbing. She drags it or into the sudden, house. It just like yeah. slams the carcass on the table. It's like, still yeah. screaming and shit as he's taking a, <laughs> the leg off. Or if it's like perfectly normal up until the point where they eat, and then all of a sudden like the camera dips lower, and then it's just like the church scene from Silver Bullet, the organ playing as they just tear into it. Shouldn't we wait for Mother Bear? No. I guess Mother Bear will just have to miss it. It's almost like dinosaurs where they have like the fridge and everything is still technically alive inside. (laughs) Anyway. So Dean, what's your number three? My number three should probably come as no surprise, but more so because you know my, my taste overall. But it was uh, one of Nickelodeon's, I think, first original cartoons uh, when it came about in the era. Well, I won't say the other ones. But in this era, it is not Cat Dog, but it's a cat and a dog. It's Ren and Stimpy. Those lips, those eyes, that gosh awful sound. It could only be Ren and Stimpy. You'll have joy. Ren and Stimpy, Ren and Stimpy, Ren and Stimpy. Like bongos beating on your brain, it's Nickelodeon's new cartoon. What is it, man? You hear it, you see it, you want to turn away, but you can't. Dark, bonding me. Too twisted for anyone but Nick. It's Ren and Stimpy, one of the Nick tunes every Sunday morning at 11, 10 central on Nick. You can hear that theme song in your head, right? Yeah. Da, da. Like Never seen stuff. an episode. Ba- really? In the words of Hootie and the Blowfish, you and me, we come from different worlds. <laughs> that explains so much of but his He knows his Eureka Cas- Eureka's Castle, but he doesn't see Ren and Stimpy. That was quality entertainment. <laughs> it was. Um, but Ren and Stimpy, I, what I realized when I was picking out my movie or uh, cartoons was I gravitated towards shows that I remember just like watching with my dad or my dad laughing at, like watching these shows together. Um, and Ren and Stimpy was probably the f- first or the earliest one that I can remember that happening. I didn't ch- specifically choose 
cartoons are like, what did my dad and I watch? And then I just realized the ones I wanted to pick. I was like, oh, it made me, I guess, just brought me closer to him, I guess. And that's why I decided to roll with the third choice being Ren and Stimpy. It, this is one of those shows that just, it's it's gross out. It's kind of, it's gross out, but it's just I think you can go back and watch it now. And it's just so many there's like adult themes, not necessarily like sexual themes. There is there are innuendos in it, but just I don't know, it shows them like in war, it shows them in all these different situations. There's there's not really The original run had taste. <laughs> and then when they rebooted it, it lost that. Oh yeah, that people I've never even seen that. I think I've seen clips and I'm like it's you're taking terrible. what you're taking the extremely well s- some subtle some not so subtle like humor and like just extrapolating it and making it like f- filthy and like this is like dirty and stupid yeah um that was in 2003 i think i think it got canceled after three episodes it was called i think so ren and stimpy adult cartoon party or something like that yeah but the original i loved they would remember you know you know who powdered toast man is tim you don't know powdered toast man i'm familiar with his work <laughs> powdered toast man powdered toast man hello fellas out of powdered toast again he was a superhero with a head just made of toast he usually just he usually came a calling when ren and simpy were out of powdered toast and he would just come replenish them he was kind of a recurring character. <laughs> he was also a horse. I like him, Mister Horse. No, sir, I don't like it. Um, mm. They, I don't know if they were the first to do this. Probably not, but they would. A part of their gross-out thing, like they would cut to these close-ups. Like, say somebody has like acne, or they just look terrible or disheveled. Like they look normal in their medium shot of the person but then it'll cut to this like really detailed painting close-up i think that technique is using like spongebob and like other yeah. cartoons but that just sticks out of my mind as a funny uh, uh i guess trait kind of animation gimmick that they would do really detailed gross <laughs> close-ups I think that's all the stuff that turned me off to it because i think when i was a kid everyone i knew liked the show but there's certain cartoons that have like that certain style that some primal response in me is just like i don't this isn't for me (laughs) i think that's why like that cat dog spongebob like none of those ever clicked with me as a kid oh i mean spongebob was too old but cat dog i couldn't i couldn't do it but spongebob is still a household favorite if he's on i'll put him on tv yeah i love spongebob that was like He's an. I mean, I would compare that to Ren and Stimpy, just in that it is enjoyable as a kid and an adult. I didn't find that until I was older. It's like they followed the same path, but then whereas Ren and Stimpy went more crude, SpongeBob's path took that same route, but was a lot more subtle with its humor. It was mindful it's, of who was. It's watching. very s- smart. It's hard. It's hard to describe other than just like smartly done. I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, just like actual funny jokes that doesn't cater to children. I mean, children find it funny because it's larger than life, but it's also just actually funny. I mean, and, and Nick, in my opinion, not Tim's, but, you know. <laughs> but Ren and Stimpy... More power to you. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I don't know, but yeah, Ren and Stimpy, more so than the other cartoons of that era. Even though I loved that era of cartoons like Doug and Don't Rugrats. name them all. I know. I can say their names. They can still be your favorite. We're not going to talk about them. Like, that's the one that, um, I don't know, that just stuck with me. And actually, they are they are making a new show. It's really? weird that I pick things that, like, all of a sudden are getting rebooted. At the same time, it's not surprising because people of our age that grew up are coming and making decisions to create these things. They're like, I want to do this again. <laughs> like, I want my childhoods. And the people that are coming into power in the media industry are like, yeah. we're doing it. So keep an eye out for that. Nicholas. Your number two. So today I'm picking Rocco's Modern Life. Stimpy, what are you watching now, you sick little monkey? Shh! I'm getting ready for Rocco. It's the world premiere of Nickelodeon's newest Nicktoon, Rocco's Modern Life. What? What in the blazes? He's a winsome little wallaby living on his own, trying to cope with everyday life with his dim-witted dog, Spunky, his best friend, Pepper, and the big heads next door. Don't miss the world premiere of Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> Sunday, September 19th on the home of Nicktoons, Nickelodeon. 
Is that one of yours? That was no. It was it was on the short list. Yeah, this was split between the two. Um, I had another alternate choice just in case. But with Rocco, he appeared in uh, late uh, 93. And this does follow the life of Rocco and his friends Heifer, Filbert, and Doug Spunky through his day-to-day life. So Rocco was voiced by Carlos Alizraki. And uh, off the top of my head, I know he's done um, Cat Dog and Reno 911. But um, behind the scenes, this show was actually pretty, like, really pivotal because this launched the career behind the scenes anyway of many other nick shows so like the storyboard artist for rocco mitch Sh- uh, mitch share um he created angry beavers um the creative oh, yeah. director steven hillenberg would eventually create our favorite sponge and tom kenny who did the voice of heifer he joined in on that project as well <gasps> i didn't know that mm-hmm. now i have to go back and listen to heifer i can hear him in my head but i can't Make the Tom Kenny connection. Yeah, it's there. It's definitely not his typical, because, like, the Ice King and SpongeBob kind of have their moments where they sound similar. Is it Ice King um, or SpongeBob? Yeah. I know it's the same voice actor, but I'm thinking, like, um, there's certain characters where I think at least he keeps his voice in a specific range that both characters um, share. SpongeBob is always, like, way higher, and then... Whenever SpongeBob is talking like a normal person, that's along the same range as the Ice King. But Heifer is just a whole different. He's trying to do something intentionally different with that. (laughs) Doesn't Heifer live? He's adopted by wolves. He's a cow that like lives with a family of wolves. (laughs) Yeah, it's always like a little plot point, not a plot point, but just the the differences come up there. I still always like quote that thing from Filbert where he's like, you know, you get a new comic book and then you got to wash your hands because you got all the ink coming off of the pages. Then you turn the page, you wash your hands. You turn the page, you wash your hands. And then you turn the page and and then you wash your hands. (laughs) They've hurt very much and um, I'm constantly in the state of wanting to throw up. (laughs) The only thing I recall from that show, I think, is didn't Rocco work for like a, a phone sex? Like a 900 number or something. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> Rocco. <laughs> Click. Yeah, he was did. Was that an ongoing thing or was that just like an episode? He lost his job working at Conglomo. Like the big Conglomo. Okay, yeah, right, right, Place right. before he started working at the local comic shop. So he went through like 10, 15 jobs in the span of an episode. He was like a plumber's assistant where he just... Oh, okay. That plumber's crack. He <laughs> okay. just, hey, can you get that? Thanks a lot. And he just keeps lifting the guy's <laughs> pants up. So that wasn't his sole career throughout the entire season or series. <laughs> I mean, they could have, but it is a kid's show after all. Even that is still amazing that you get away with putting that. It's like, I guess maybe they just had more sense that like a kid doesn't know at all what that means. They might repeat it. I don't know. I don't know. Apparently there's a... Call it. There's a cut scene I found out later on where um, Rocco and Filbert had to stay at a motel. And when they asked for the nightly rates, the manager was like, really? Nightly? Usually people ask for hourly. And apparently they <laughs> cut that line out. <laughs> you know, that, a kid would never think twice about what that means. Yeah, really. I'm fond of the nipples of the future. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed all Tim, the there was classic... a character. There's like a superhero character. I think there'd be like people... I don't know. He he literally he, it would, somebody's having a crisis and he's like, "Don't worry, like just look into my nipples of the future." And they would his nipples would like erect off of his suit and jump and like suction cup under their eyeballs. And <laughs> it was a really really big man. <laughs> he was huh. just showing them the future through his nipples. It was fantastic. I realize all the nipples Nick, of the future. All the Nick cartoons had a like a superhero idol through a good amount of them. <laughs> Crimson Chin, Rugrats Fairly wasn't there a fictional. One? I mean, there's they Reptar, had, but I yeah, guess yeah, they had Reptar. Alt, I am Reptar. Reptar on ice. Thorg hungry. Thorg want eat. <laughs> Rocco's <laughs> Rocco's modern the things life. Things I remember. Great choice. Um, yeah, I was on my never shirt saw list. it, but I I know you guys appreciate it and i know a lot of people that loved it i think you would i think you could find watch it now yeah like i'm wondering if it like it didn't click with me as a kid i wonder if that might be one of the shows that if i watch now like i might 
find amusing. They rebooted it recently with the Netflix movie, and it was kind of cool to watch. Yeah, I, all that stuff went on my radar. I didn't hear about that. Yeah, it came out a couple years ago. I think it's still there. It's like um, Rocco's Static Cling or something. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, they, it was static little, cling, colon. It's um little tongue in cheek because I guess he was launched into space, so he missed out on the last like thirty years of pop culture so it's like him learning how to use a cell phone and i always like love that. that kind of shit i don't actually remember watching it i i know i watched it but i don't remember anything that really stood out from it it didn't have to be made but it was cool to watch just as like a nostalgia's sake and i think that's really what they were going for so i guess they succeeded because it keeps it looks like it keeps the aesthetic you know it's like it doesn't betray yeah and all the voice the actors came back too from what i could tell yeah I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I, I think overall, with your putting this on the list, I'll go see if I can find it again just to check it out. Give it a, a re-watch. So yeah. that brings us to my number two. Yeah, so speaking of tastes... Number two. In September so, Tim, of 19... Wait, what? What Italian 1940s cartoon you got this time? 1993. This was around the time that they had a toy line called Polly Pocket, and they had a spinoff for boys because they couldn't play with Polly Pocket, so they had to have Mighty Max. What came first? It was the, the it was the toy, right? Yeah. So Mighty Max, I don't remember what channel it came on. I don't know if it was like the UPN. UPN or something. It was it, one of the shows that like it wasn't a Saturday morning cartoon from what I remember. It was. And I don't remember what channel it came on. It was kind of like the Sonic the Hedgehog show of I just remember it was on TV, but I have no idea how I found it. Yeah, it was on like UPN. Somebody else is gonna walk in and watch it and it's just like static. It was on UPN at the earliest fucking hours in the day, so unless your ass was up at 6 a.m., you weren't going to watch it. And that was a show that yeah. I always wanted to watch, but I never did because of the. it was on a terrible time block. It was yeah. really tough to watch it, and I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday morning thing, but even if it was or wasn't, I wasn't watching cartoons at 6 a.m., and if I was, it was because I was getting ready for school and I happened to be near a TV. But usually when it was yeah. like getting ready for school kind of thing, that was, you know, getting dressed, have whatever quick breakfast, and then my ass is in the car 10, 15 minutes later. Just like a bite of toast. Yeah. Thanks, Ma. Sorry, Mom. Gotta go. I have no recollection of the show. You don't remember Mighty Max? No. What was like the big... So... Uh, sorry. What was like the... What was the... When did it start? It started in 1993. Um, Man, I don't so remember So the guy who created it, um, Mark Zaslov... He, I never realized how much he had done because I guess like he was involved in creating like DuckTales, Tailspin, Bobby's World, Bonkers, Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad, like just a, a ton of stuff from around that time. But like, see, if you don't know, Dean, and for anybody else that doesn't know. So like, as I said, it was created based on the toy line of miniature play sets, spun off from Polly Pocket and all of that. And I remember having like maybe one Mighty Max toy. And I never truly got into it because like, I was a dyed-in-the-wool action figure kid. Like, to me, to have these tiny little things on a tiny little handheld playset wasn't as cool as having, like, my actual, whatever, like, six-inch figures or five-inch figures kind of deal. So the whole show itself follows Max as he gets, like, a magic baseball cap that he ends up getting bequeathed uh, that allows him to portal through different times and places, a la, like, a kid's version of Sliders. And he has, like, the help of his companions, this bird person, Virgil, and his bodyguard, Norman, who's this, like, giant Viking, uh, voiced by Richard Mull. So we had, like, a bunch of different voice actors throughout this. Like, the villain is Skullmaster, who is Tim Curry. Skullmaster, let the boy go. Reveal the location of the Arcana, and I will. Deny me, and I'll cut the boy a new smile. And we had other people like Nick mentioned Rob Paulson before. Robert Paulson was Max on this show. We had Kenneth Mars as Professor Zygote. Tress McNeil as Max's mother. Uh, David Warner was on it as a uh, character Talon. 
and uh, of course Frank Welker, um, just because I can't go an episode without mentioning a project that Frank Welker's in as the Lava Lord. But it's interesting, first of all, seeing Rob Paulson and like Tress McNeil both on this show and then doing like Animaniacs and all these other projects together of like a such a tight knit community for the voice actors, I assume, just because I feel like they're always popping up in projects with each other over and over again. But for Rob Paulson, that, he was in the, sorry, he, he voiced, I think he was Raphael in the Ninja Turtles cartoon. He was. Yeah. There's a cool skit that they do whenever they go to Comic Cons. Um, depending on which one they do, they usually do it in the Salt Lake City one, because that's where I see the YouTube clips from. But a bunch of the voice actors, pretty much everyone that you just named is usually on the panel, and then some. But they'll read movie scripts and the characters they're known as. <laughs> and it's actually really fun to watch, because they'll get shout out recommendations from the audience so like all right so this scene from turtles one we're gonna have shredder voiced by you know tress mcneil and she's gonna play the crazy cat lady from futurama and she's gonna portray those lines acting as you know her character <laughs> that's pretty cool yeah we're like we're gonna do the scene from the matrix and rob paulson you're gonna do Raphael as neo I remember during like when we would have like road trips and whatnot, you started playing those and I got big into those for a while. It's fun just seeing all of them interact. And plus the, even though it's like, they're just going off the script, it's still like the improv nature of them being able to introduce their own voices and flair to it. But the best part too is they're just their chemistry. You could tell yeah. that they've all been working together for so long that, Sometimes it's like, you know, Tress McNeil and Rob Paulson are, you know, two thirds of um, the Animaniacs. So on yeah. top of that, some of them that may not have been a part of like a Warner Brothers project or just in general, just they've all worked together from one project or another that, you know, it's almost like their own little small family. Yeah. Was Mr. <laughs> I almost said Mr. Max. <laughs> Mr. Max Canteen. <laughs> Best burgers in town. Deep cut. Um, so he was the, it was like a, it was the, you know, the toy was a capsule, open it, little people, Polly Pocket kind of thing, right? Yeah. Was it, so did the toys just based around the concept of like, he could go to all these different places? Yeah. Was, so was, the... He wasn't like changing, I know like the toy is small, it doesn't mean he has to be like, they don't like, he doesn't change size or Oh anything, no, yeah, he? like there's just... no size thing in okay. the the show itself gotcha um but like the different little play sets it would be like oh the lava thing and whatnot so that would make sense in some of the episodes but yeah because he essentially they would portal place to place and like fight whatever the evil is in that location or constantly try to thwart skull master but for anybody that doesn't want mighty max spoilers uh, i guess <laughs> skip ahead um <laughs> So I remember specifically I'm gonna, the I'm show... I'm going to excuse myself for a second. <laughs> I remember specifically the show had such a downer ending because after all this, they get to like the final battle with Skullmaster and on like the last episode, um, Norman and Virgil die in battle and it's like just Max left and he's losing. So as a last ditch effort, he uses the hat to portal himself back in time to the beginning of the series for the first episode. And then he like, I think it's like Virgil leaves a note or something of additional information. That way they'll do the whole thing over again from beginning. But hopefully this time, so like a back to the future thing. It this time, so like what was this, that? so like a back to the future thing where he yeah kind of warns Doc to wear a bulletproof vest. Yeah, so now it's like a new game plus. But I just remember that it's like wow, that is a. I mean, I guess it's hopeful because now with this knowledge, hopefully they can do it this time. But also, they never really say, is this the first time he's had to do that? <laughs> is this just mm. a time loop he's permanently stuck in forever, battling Skullmaster and failing? Well, that's that's why you don't fuck with time travel, because you don't know if... Uh... We don't know which theory's right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that is Mighty Max. Mighty Max Canteen. <laughs> I did wish I could see that more. What was that? I did wish I could watch that show more. I did like it a lot as a kid, but it was just so impossible to find. Now you can. It's on YouTube. One thing, sorry, that made me think of, I wanted to ask uh, Nick on the subject of, well, 
to ask both of you, but Nick talking about how it was on too early. What was your shows that were like, for me, I just, Bobby's World and Rocket Power are in my head as like, I'm eating cereal at the kitchen table before school and just turn on the TV to watch like whatever cartoon is on. <laughs> and it was usually like Bobby's World and yeah, Rocket Power. Those are the two that are sticking in my head. Ewoks. Ewoks? There was a cartoon Ewoks? Yeah. I distinctly I remember notice. getting ready for school. I was getting dressed and the show was on. I didn't know what the fuck it was until much later on. I put two and two together and realized I was watching the Ewoks cartoon. So I must have been like two or three. <laughs> the deep cut. I remember growing up, my brother was older than me. So when he would get up for school, he would be in like, I was in elementary school. He was in middle school. I was in middle school. He was in high school. So he would have to get up earlier. So instead of like sleeping in, I would just get up too. So I would usually be up at like 530 in the morning. So I would go turn on like UPN or whatever the channel was or like early in the morning WB. And at like 530, they would play this Starship Troopers show, Roughnecks. Hmm. And then after that, it would be Beast Wars. And then after that at seven o'clock, it would be Pokemon. And then once Pokemon was done, it was time for me to start getting ready for school to catch the bus at 8.30. Damn, you caught the bus at 8.30? Yeah. How long was it to ride to school? Uh, like 30 minutes. Jeez. Because I'm so used to starting school at like eight, ten after 8 o'clock. The other one is um the Ghostbusters cartoon. Real, Ghostb- real Ghostbusters? No. Ghostbusters. Ah, uh, real Ghostbusters? Um. <laughs> the, the reason they had the real Ghostbusters moniker is because there's another Ghostbusters show with two guys and a gorilla. <laughs> now that's the better name. <laughs> yeah. Two guys, a gorilla and a pizza place. It's actually based off of like a, a live action show from the seventies, but they turned it into um a cartoon. I still remember the, there was like a, a point in the show where they almost did like a Adam West Batman montage of them changing in the costume. I'll send it to you guys. But I remember that also as a kid. I had to look it up and double check and make sure that was the name. Yeah, I remember we got the VHS for that and I saw it and I was like, this isn't Ghostbusters. Yeah, what the fuck is this? Oh, well, that's, <laughs> isn't that cartoon the original? I remember I watched the, um, what's that Netflix series? The, the movies that made us. Yeah. The Ghostbusters one. I think this cartoon was like preventing them from naming it Ghostbusters and they had to like fight to. Yeah, like, that's why they had to name. do the, the real Ghostbusters. We're not those ones. I mean, yeah, I, even the movie, the title of the movie, they were like having trouble calling it Ghostbusters. Oh, no, that was from a 50s. No, I'm sorry. Oh, wait. Yes, it's the same thing. The cartoon is based on the movie Ghostbusters with the gorilla that prevented them from calling it Ghostbusters at first. So yeah. they had to fight for it. I didn't realize that was made into a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It looks kind of familiar, the gorilla. But anyway, digressing. So, Dean. Number two. Well... Here at Screen Refresh, doing our rule of thirds, I know myself and Nick like to bend the rules here a little bit. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> as Tim prepares. No, um, well, can, it, I, can I take a guess if you're saying you're bending the rules? Yes. Is it reboot? I don't know what that is. Never mind then. <laughs> Forget you said I don't anything. picture Dean as the reboot type. What's a reboot? I have to know now before I reveal. Reboot was a one of the first iterations of like 3D or like CGI shows. So it wasn't really a cartoon because the whole thing was kind of like a... I think all of the characters were oh, programs inside like yeah. a Yeah, it looks like thing. Roblox. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It's, it, I don't know, it just looks... Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, it looked kind of like Beast Wars type deal. Yeah. Yeah, fairly crude. It's like a PlayStation... So playstation uh, cinematic or something guess i'm wrong go ahead dean yes um no but my uh selection for number two again i would love i would stay up stay up to watch this show with my dad it was space ghost coast to coast in space nobody can hear you scream <laughs> so i lied Greetings, Earthlings. I'm Space Ghost, and this is the set of my talk show on Cartoon Network, the place where we grill famous stars and get the nitty-gritty on their private lives. So what you been up to? Yeah, I know. Does it ever itch right here? 
That's just a sampling of the in-depth interviews you'll see on Space Coast Coast to Coast, only on Cartoon Network. That's Friday nights at 11 on Cablevision for you Earthlings. I mean, I think that's still technically a cartoon. It's a cartoon. It's Not just a uh... children's cartoon, but a cartoon. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it came on in 94, and I definitely started watching it probably, eh, probably maybe a couple of years after that. But Didn't he eat, interview, like, Jim Carrey for one of his movies? Yeah, that's actually, well, there's an episode that's actually on the mask VHS. It's like a special. I saw the same like, one. At the, after the end credits, there's a random Space Coast, Coast to Coast episode that where they, as a promo, I guess? I don't yeah. know. Buy the DVD, buy the mask and get Space Coast Coast to Coast. That was my only exposure to him. Did you ever watch the Space Ghost show? I probably did. There was a... I'm digressing again, but there was a period where I would be... My grandmother, my mother's mother, would babysit me. And I would sit there in the middle of the day and watch, like, the old Hanna-Barbera block. Yeah. It'd be, like, Three Space Ghost, Birdman, all those, like, 60s cartoons. Um, yeah. It was the caveman with the, with the horns. And he had, like, a horn. He had a cape. We talked about this before. Captain Caveman? Uh, no, it was like a, a Hanna Bar, like a hero, like a not a like a goofy dude. Because I know there was what was the one that had like the like the the sentient goo pile with the two eyes, um, and like the rhino or something. He was like a Conan type thing or like a He Man, but he would yeah. have the was it Herculoids? Mm. Oh God, this is gonna drive me insane. That was outside my childhood. I saw the mask video with Space Ghost, but I didn't watch anything like that until the C Lab Frisky Dingo era. <laughs> that was like 2001 when Adult Swim really kicked off. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the Space Ghost. It was definitely not my wheelhouse right away. It might have been 96 when that came out. But if you don't know, Space Ghost Coast to Coast was the first, like, one of the first, I think, Cartoon Network produced shows. Specifically, that one was for adults. It wasn't like super raunchy or anything. It was just, it was, it's a pseudo talk show format and they recycled just animation cells every episode. Like the same animations come up the entire episode as Space Ghost hosts the show, talking to real celebrities. Um, obviously pre recorded celebrities that come up on his television. They're kind of like, they say they're on Earth or whatever. And Space Ghost is in his, uh, station with, his uh, other characters from the show, uh, Moltar and Zorak, who are like nemesis. And they're like, I think the idea is they're like doomed to help him produce this show <laughs> as like punishment, like for their crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Zorak is like his uh, band leader. I think his band's The Way Out. Uh, and Moltar is like the control room, the director, essentially like just trying to end the show as quickly as possible every episode. And Zorak, they just... They just have show their distaste for uh, Space Ghost, but it's just kind of like a little irreverent show that mostly went off of its interviews, um, but later became very surreal. I think once it got to Adult Swim, I know the Aqua Teen Hunger Force was born on Space Ghost. Was it? Yeah. Hmm. There's early iterations of all the characters on that on the show. I don't know how they got incorporated because I think I don't know if I was watching it as much at that time. But they interview cele- Space Ghost will interview celebrities, and is, he kind of presumes they're celebrities and tries to talk about what their superpowers are. And they take their kind of like I was going to say between two ferns, but they take the celebrities. I don't know if they just they interview somebody interviews the celebrity beforehand, then they take that footage and cut together new questions and answers and kind of like take it out of context just to make jokes. I just remember really laughing as a kid. My dad laughed, and we sat there and watched it together. Now. That answers an age-old question for me, Dean, because even as a child, I remember watching this, like, we would watch cartoons when I mentioned, like, Tex Avery and Chuck Jones, and then Cartoon Network would, like, it was like 11.30 or whatever it was, or 11, and then it would be Space Ghost Coast to Coast, and to me, that would be the time of, like, okay, that's the end of my cartoons, time for us (laughs) to go down in the basement and play, like, PlayStation 2 at my grandparents'. And even as a child, it's like, I didn't dislike the show. I just always wondered, who is this for? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you you would have to have an understanding of, like, late night talk show shtick. So yeah, I, I think... was like, I don't dislike this. I just feel like I don't fully get it. I would say it's kind of like Between Two Ferns in that it's apparent 
that the when the celebrities are talking, like I don't know if they knew or know totally what they're in for or what's being asked of them. Just to, just at the reactions to these questions that are then later mashed up with like new dialogue from from the characters on the cartoon. Yeah, um, I never really watched watched it much because come eleven o'clock at night, I'm usually trying to watch that scramble channel. <laughs> <laughs> when the sound comes on after 11 o'clock yeah side note um my sega cd or whatever something i had running like my sega cd through my vcr and then into the tv kind of descrambled it a little bit you lucky bastard <laughs> yeah <laughs> parents are like wow dude you really play that sega cd a lot <laughs> in your room alone it <laughs> it became not like distorted, but more like fuzzy. Like you gotta smack the bunny ears, kind of kind of look to it. <laughs> Is that what they're calling it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, just go over there and smack the bunny. It ears. was smack the bunny ears five. That's what I was watching. <laughs> um, what do you want for Christmas, Dean? A Sega CD and tissues. <laughs> whatever, whatever system is using the cable port still. <laughs> um. But yeah, Space Ghost. I know the Brack show was a spinoff of that. My name is Brack. Um, I vaguely remember watching that show. That came out a Space lot later, Ghost didn't character. it? It did, yeah. Because I remember I watched that, that was one on the a adults. little bit. That was like 2003 or four, I think, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, like it. I was. I don't know. Just something about the. It's like a TV show, talk show gone wrong. You know what I mean? It's like it's nothing goes as it's supposed to, and I guess that's what I thought was funny about it. It's like us. Yeah, we're wrong. Space so Coast. good pick. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought Space Ghost Coast to Coast, but once you said it, it's a perfect fit. It is cartoons. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I agree with that. I yeah. just mean there's real people in the show too, but you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, still primarily cartoon. I don't think that's so much bending. I, if like you said, you know, Eureka's Castle or like Bear in the Big Blue House, I would. <laughs> I mean, that just be like that's oh, outside of the spirit. I mean, it's meant for children, but it's kind of <laughs> pushing the whole cartoon aspect. Oh, wait, was it supposed to be meant for children? I mean, it was childhood cartoons, but right. not specifically children's cartoons. Okay, cool. So I just check that still counts. You were just... So I could have been watching... I could have said, like, I watched heavy metal, like, ad nauseum. Or, I mean, that was a movie. So that Fire and ice, good. sir. I mean, if you grew up with it <laughs> and watched it every day as a kid... <laughs> Next on Nick, it's heavy metal. Followed by Fire and Ice from the visual imagination of Ralph Bakshi. I watched the hell out of um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and that was not meant for kids. Oh, yeah. but I really loved American Pop. Hmm? Um, do you remember Doing American Pop? It was, it was a movie? No. It was no. animated, but it was like this family through generations via music. Ralph Bakshi, creator of Fritz the Cat and Lord of the Rings, now takes modern animation a quantum leap forward with a motion picture of incredible beauty. American Pop, the story of one family, four generations, in love with the greatest music of all time. American Pop, the state of the art in living animation. Rated R. Check your newspapers for the special movie preview near you. I only watched The Wall by Pink Floyd. The animated parts. That was the my wall weirded me out as a kid. <laughs> I didn't see it as a kid. I'm surprised you did. It's because, like, as a kid, when they would have, um, like, pop-up video, we always used to sit down Sunday morning and watch TV together while we're having breakfast after, like, church. And we would turn it on because it's like, oh, I want to watch pop-up video. So my brother and I would get excited. And then one time it was, like, not pop-up video and they were just playing the wall. And I remember catching a bit of it and I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> and I was like, we need to change this. Turn on Jeopardy. You're missing a key ingredient in that viewing. Well, yeah. Child I had a hard LSD. life when I was four, so I had called it quits by five. <laughs> so, Nicholas, your first pick. So, this was 2001, so I still consider myself pretty young, considering... And this is before all of the mainstream Adult Swim kind of stuff. So my first and final choice is actually Invader Zim. From Nickelodeon's animation studio in Hollywood, Nicktoon World News with Henry and June. 
Good evening, I'm Henry. And I'm June. Today, home safety. But first, a look at the brand new Nicktoon, Invader Zim. The show stars Zim in the role of Zim, an alien bent on taking over the Earth. To do so, he disguises himself as Zim, an Earthling grade school student. Creator Joe Nen Vasquez based the show on real life experience. That's right. He himself was once an Earthling grade school student. And now, home safety with Mr. Foot. Premiered in 2001. I don't know how this show made it into Nickelodeon's domain because just the the kid, the guy that wrote the show and created it is the creator of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, the graphic novel series. So Nickelodeon at one point had to have had a boardroom discussion deciding on what their next project was. And you got it. I love Zim. He's super successful. But just Jonan Vasquez was like 20 when Zim was not even 20. He was young. So the board members must have looked at this kid and was like, yeah, I see a cartoon worthy of our uh, young teenage audience. And I'm just thinking, like, that shit never would fly today. I wonder if at the time, in their head, they were thinking, like, we could be getting on the ground floor of another, like, Tim Burton kind of deal. Of, like, oh, it's, like, weird, it's edgy, let's let him loose here. <laughs> I'm glad he did. The Like, the humor was never nearly as graphic as his comics were, but... No. Um, it definitely, would like, tiptoed the darker aspect of comedy and just the storytelling in general. There was a lot of episodes where I know parents got really pissed off about. My, I remember my parents got into it. Like my dad had an Invader Zim t-shirt, but then there were episodes that would come on that they would be like surprised. Like there was one episode where something about like replacing a kid's eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I was, even as a kid, I was just like, Ooh, looking around the room, like ah, I should probably watch this somewhere else. <laughs> Maybe bring Gur back out for another dance. <laughs> well, if you've never heard of or didn't know about Invader Zim, it is about an alien um, that is trying to conquer Earth. It's kind of their whole shtick, and they have this really big convention periodically on um, the, I think it was called like the, the Grand Assignment or something. It's It's been a while since I'd seen it. But it's when they announce and dispatch all of the specific invaders that are new to their new, um, you know, places where they're supposed to conquer. And Zim is kind of like the black sheep of the whole race. No one likes him. He really wants to be an invader, but just no one takes him seriously. And he's just really bad at everything. The assigning is over, Zim. But you can't have an invasion without me. I was in Operation Impending Doom 1. Don't you remember? Oh, yes. We remember. <laughs> but, sir, we're still on our own planet! Silence! Twist those knobs! Twist those knobs! You, pull some levers! Pull some levers! So he thinks he's this grand manipulator and perfect example of his Urken race, when in reality everyone just kind of makes fun of him and hates him for it. So all of the invaders get this really badass um, robot that's supposed to help them. So Gurr is um, just... L created through like a bunch of trash and stuff because they just really don't like him and they give him the stupidest thing alive to just kind of say like here it's official you have one now go get out of here so they send him off to earth which is like on the very far edge of their map to the point where they really don't care and they figure like all right you know what he's happy he's doing his thing and just we'll ignore him and then we just follow his adventures trying to take over the world poorly a lot of dark humor Pretty good jokes. And then the movie re reboot they did, they also did that as a reboot recently on Netflix. And I thought that was pretty well done. The whole original cast came back for that too. They're just doing everything, aren't they? Yep. I was just going to say, I'm very aware of Invader Zim, but I don't think I ever actually sat down to watch an episode of it. I know it's very popular. It fits my humor style perfectly. It, A lot of it comes from this, to be quite honest. I never saw the the one they did later that you mentioned, like the the movie or whatever. Mm. But I like the show 
And I think if I rewatch the show, like it's parts of it will probably still stand up enough that it makes me interested to see the movie. But I mean, it's, it's just always a case of there is not enough time in the day to keep up with all of these things. The movie was good. And um, that one I remember a lot more than Rocco because the movie was kind of treated like it was the f- the final season and it closed a lot of the loopholes and story together. So even though a massive amount of time passes, just like in Rocco where... You know, it's been like 20, 30 years. It picks up right where it left off kind of thing. I didn't know the concept, and Nick describing it, it sounds like a pretty good setup or basis for a show. It might be up here. To go in any direction after that. It it can be as extreme as Ren and Stimpy. The humor is definitely different. It's a lot more of like the... I can't even describe it, because usually you would describe other things to Zim. But he's fucking crazy and you can see homicidal tendencies in them even though they never go there completely it does not pull punches in certain ways and it does a lot of like screaming like the kid <laughs> isn't going quietly when he literally rips the kids you see the shadow like against the wall as the machine grabs the kids eyes and replaces them with like robotic ones thank you zim But it's it's pretty extreme at some points. <laughs> but it just reinforces just the I don't know how the fuck Nickelodeon greenlit this whole thing because it right. just it's that extreme. And then you have like shit like that, and then you have other moments where Zim is abducting cows and he's trying to just steal their poop. <laughs> and one of the lines he says is like, "Once I've tainted the humans' meat supply with filth, they will be ripe for conquest." Soon the name of Invader Zim will be synonymous with Dookie! Sir, bring me cow? Yes, sir! And just the way that Richard Horvitz, the voice of Zim, just emphasizes that he screams every line, and that's part of what makes it so hilarious. I think the main thing that always sticks out from the show for me is, I, I don't remember what episode, it was like the SWAT team, and they're like, Hey, that's the guy! And he's back for more! <laughs> if it's on streaming, I kind of want to go back, just if nothing else, just to throw it on the background, just because I'm kind of nostalgic for that. It's one of my favorites. Because let it's me pretty see. Unique style. It's one of the first uh, cartoon shows to also have CGI in it. Oh, right now it's available to stream via Paramount Plus. Oh, don't they so have? Oh, have that makes Paramount sense. Plus, because don't they have the new um, Rugrats show on there too? Oh, yeah. So, so if you have Paramount Plus, or if you ever did a trial for Paramount Plus and then forgot to cancel it like I did, uh, you can watch it now. As soon as I sign up for free trials, I immediately put a calendar meeting <laughs> with notifications like cancel, cancel this, cancel this on this day. It depends on the price, because if it's something that's like four ninety nine a month or something, I may forget about it just because it's, yeah, if there's shows that I'll watch on it, I'll, once I run out of shows, then I'll cancel it. I guess to be honest, the only time I'm really doing that is like, well, today's the Super Bowl and I don't have cable. Like, time to do you or you know, <laughs> time to do Hulu a free trial TV. somewhere. Uh. <laughs> Sixty dollars. I'm like, no, nope, it's free trial. Cancel it. Dean seven right. at gmail dot com. Dean eight at gmail dot com. <laughs> exactly. Credit card. You got it. <laughs> so nick i I will revisit invader zam just because now you've made me miss it i will not revisit it i want a i will visit it i want a curated list of episodes send me your best invader zam nick i want it i'm gonna have to it's only two seasons i'm sure i can bang it out for 21 it's only two seasons yeah it was or at least in unless there's only two seasons on paramount plus no, there's only two seasons. Uh, oh, okay. No, there's three. There's three oh, seasons. Then, yeah, they only have two online then. It's surprising because it just seemed like it permeated, I'm not, you know, I'm culture. not big into having autographs, but that's one of the few things I have autographs of. I have um, Richard uh, Horvitz and uh, Ricky Simons. Simmons? Simons. He plays Gur. Very cool. I'm also into not... I like having a bunch of stuff signed. I have a few precious things signed which is cool but 
Yeah. The autographs are for the the special. Oh, yeah. The special. So good pick, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. What is yours? So my number one for this week. Number one. Premiered on Halloween of 1992. Shit. On Fox Kids. You might know it. X-Men the Animated Series. Woo! Wolverine cuts to the heart of the matter. We get him. And we shred him. Watch the premiere of X-Men Saturday morning, October 31st on Fox. I feel like that's... You have to, the, you have to everybody... pause while I play the theme song in my head. Just wait. A few moments later. Previously on X-Men. It's it's my ringtone like that. <laughs> that thing slaps. Oh, um, yeah. It's one of so the best. The, the theme song, actually, Ron Wasserman, um, the one who worked on that theme song, also did the theme song for Power Rangers. And then did the music for VR Troopers, Mummies Alive, and the original dub of Dragon Ball Z. So, I mean, he had his hand in everything that was musically inclined for most of my childhood. Awesome. So, for anyone unfamiliar. um, So, yeah, like, it's one of the shows that shaped my childhood and instilled this love of comics beyond what my father introduced us to at the time. And then despite being on Fox Kids as an animated show, I feel it never felt simplified or dumbed down for a child audience. Like we had character deaths, we had dealing with mutant human prejudice, we had all sorts of pulled storylines from the comics for the past like 20 something years at that point or 30 years, albeit like changed here and there. So like the Days of Future Past, they cover in the show, but instead of Kitty Pride, they end up doing it with Lucas Bishop. Um, which was also my first introduction to Bishop as a character, which is cool. Um, They've made him less cool over time, but I don't know where he stands now. (laughs) Less cool, like he's a dick or like he's just not as interesting? So originally in this, like he was cool. He like came from the future and he was here to stop an assassination. Um, That way it doesn't turn into like the future he's in and they have like the whole Sentinel program. But then in the comics, I just know over time they started making him a little more like fanatical about things. And it, he got like a little too intense during like the, I think like the mid to late 2000s. I don't know where he stands now. Like I've been reading the X books, but I feel like there's just so many of them now that unless I dedicate my life to only reading X-Men, I will fall behind. Um, because it's, I feel like there's like nine books a month just for X-Men <laughs> stories alone. There's a, uh, sorry, just speaking of Bishop, there's a pretty cool Bishop figure coming out from Mezco. They oh, make yeah. like super high end, um, one twelfth scale, like six, six inch figures, and the Bishop looks pretty cool. That, looks that does cool. look cool. Um, I like I have, also how they have the, the blasts from the gun. Yeah, they, they're, their effects are great. These are higher end, so like Bishop's 90 bucks. That's but not like, bad. Oh my God. When, you, when you pick it up and, and you see it in person, it's like, yeah, I can. It's it, a. It's imported, so those are usually always that's worth ninety more expensive. But it's great. I mean, I don't know. This is great, but I know the Quark company is great. I have Cyclops and Gambit, Jim Lee style, and I'm waiting on Wolverine to come out. But I'd um, spend ninety on that. Yeah, the I want to play with them. Great. <laughs> you, I know it's like the ones that you like. This is what I. You look at what you had as a kid, like the 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 toy biz figures from the '90s of X Men. You're like, yep. In your head, it was like. This is amazing, but in your head, what you're seeing is this now, like what toys, the high-end stuff that they come out with now, like that's what you thought you were playing with. Like, I remember as a kid going into Toys R Us or like KB Toys at the mall and seeing like the cardboard and plastic pop packaging for like Wolverine and Sabretooth with like the, the flip action where you do the switch on the back and he heals his damage or he pops his claws and they were like eleven ninety nine. And I had a literal, like a trunk full of action figures um, (laughs) that took up most of my closet. And I would create storylines in my head and I would just sit there and have like DC versus Marvel. They would have to do a team up to fight like some guys from the Jurassic Park because one time I just like found an action figure somewhere and he happened to be from like the Jurassic Park was like the InGen or something like that. And I just brought it home. I was like, oh, well, you lead the Foot Clan now. <laughs> so, yeah, th- this show was responsible for a majority of my 
love of both action figures, my love of comics at the time. Um, it got me into... And the mall? And the mall. So <laughs> actually, this this show still stands, and I've mentioned it before, as my perfect example of how to introduce characters for an intro episode with that mall sequence. So we have Jubilee as our kind of the the character reference for the audience because she's new to the getting involved with the X-Men. She's new to learning all about this. So it's kind of the same stand-in that we had earlier in the comics um, with Kate Pride or Kitty Pride. So we have Jubilee getting like there's a sentinel attack at the mall that she's at and it's targeting mutants and she's running away. But as she's running away, she's getting introduced to all the different X-Men who are all at the mall. Like Gambit's trying to talk up some girl at a one of the, the retail shops. We have like Cyclops just like walking through doing Cyclops things. We have, I think it was like Gene and Storm or something or like Rogue and Storm just like shopping by themselves. And we get to experience all their personalities bit by bit. So you can take them all in in stride. We had her seeing like they help out. So you get to see an experience of like their powers that they can do. And then this all leads into her getting brought in and explained to the X-Men of like their involvement. Perfect example of how to do an introduction for characters and get your like everybody up to speed on what's going on without it being exposition heavy, without it being kind of like too heavy handed or forced chef's kiss. <laughs> so, uh. but, so even aside from the characters from like the comics and whatnot, it introduced some characters like the series also introduced the character morph who can just transform into anybody, which I believe he was a character unique to the show that I loved for all of one episode he was in before he died in the pilot or did he, um, and kind of cemented Wolverine as my favorite mutant as a kid until I got deeper into comics and eventually he was replaced. Um, but he was number one of the game, number one in my heart for years. Tossed aside like Woody when Buzz came around. <laughs> Once I got bigger into the comics and I start like seeing all these other characters and I'm just, I've been waving a flag for Phantom X for years, but they never use him in like anything. Who the hell is that? And that's like why. Phantom, exactly, to, exactly to your point. Phantom X was another part of the Weapon X program later on, who was like a part Sentinel kind of thing. He looks like a, uh, there was a French like comic, Storm I think Shadow. Diabolique or something, where he would end up, like he had like a white mask and whatnot, and he carried two guns, and he was like an expert thief. And his whole thing was he can use like uh, the power of persuasion to give people like illusions and things like that. But he was just a really fun character that I found out about in Rick Remender's run on X-Force. But hither nor tither, check out Phantom X, check out like all of that run of X-Force. It was really great. Um, and then go watch X-Men, the animated series before they do the Disney plus reboot in 2023 for X-Men 97 that I guess they're bringing um, almost all of the voice cast back that's still alive because I think the voice actor who was Cyclops passed away. Um, but they're going to do it as a continuation from where they left off with the original run in the 90s. I hope they don't, don't even change the animation style. I agree. I want them to keep it looking like shit compared to what today is. <laughs> Just keep it exactly like hand-drawn style no computer graphics and stuff and whatever computer graphics they use make it that like 20 year old computers that they do it on None well, of that new so, Disney shit. i feel like the first three seasons were great in the show and then towards the end of the series the animation i think studio changed or something because it started looking different like not drastically different but enough that i noticed it was like oh this is like a, a quality dip it looks weird so I hope they go back to like the animation of the first three seasons. And if they do additional work with like, oh, computer work and whatnot, I hope they just do it to help like smooth frames um, or things like that while still maintaining like the integrity of the original show. But they did a, a spinoff comic for a while about five years back, all I think X-Men 92. But it was a comic series that looked almost exactly like the original show. It followed along a lot of the same like storylines and the feel, the tone, that it was really fun and I had a great time with it and kind of, I guess, like reinvigorate a lot of people's excitement and nostalgia for bringing back the show itself. A question for 
I guess this mainly applies to Spider-Man, Batman, the animated series, X-Men. Do they just adapt storylines from the comic? Do they change a lot when they do things? Like, I know you said some characters, oh, it's, it was this guy instead of this girl. or They Facebook, didn't so, with but Batman. But, like, do they pretty much... No? No. They didn't with Batman, because they changed some of the storylines so radically or added new things, but they'd done it so well that it changed the comics to reflect those stories because of how good they were. Hmm. So, like, yeah, Harley Quinn right. wasn't around before the animated series, and then she made her debut there, and, you know... Oh, wow, I didn't made. know that. Same thing with Mr. Freeze. His typical, um, well, my Nora is now frozen because I had to cryogenically freeze her because of her disease. That was not the case for his story before that. Or at least making yeah. him a tragic villain. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah, that was kind of a question. That's exactly what I was I can't speak for. on behalf of the other ones, but just uh, Batman, I just know that that one was... I know X-Men pulled a lot from the comics, a lot of the Claremont run. So that was a lot of the similar storylines just kind of altered because we need to be able to tell this story in one to two, maybe three episodes kind of deal. Um, So you only really have like an hour to cover 10, 15 issues kind of stuff. But part of my thing for a while has been going back and Rewatching the series while also reading through the comics that they pulled from and then kind of just for my own enjoyment running a comparison in my head of like what stuff they changed what stuff they yeah didn't, all of that that'd be interesting but, mondo during uh what would have been san diego comic-con a bunch of companies did you know their own releases and stuff online i think i showed you guys this but i managed to order one before it sold out mondo is releasing a one-sixth scale so like 12 inch tall, I think, uh, 10, 10 inch tall figure of Jim Lee Wolverine from based on the cartoon. And it comes in the packaging on a bed holding the picture frame of Gene Gray. <laughs> 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 like the meme, I just sent a picture. That's awesome. Um, that's the packaging that it comes in. It's pretty funny. But it, it's, a, it's a really solid looking figure too. But they're, it's awesome they went to package it this way. It's like a reality. <laughs> um, he it actually comes with a morph head which I, which is pretty cool that is so you fun. can pretend it's morph but i just had to share that with you again so everybody check out the, the figure lines that dean mentioned and <laughs> keep an eye out for x-men 97 coming i guess in 2023 on disney plus which brings us to dean your first pick the simpsons Wait, really? Yeah, it's the same. Oh, there was no preamble to that. It no. Just... I'm done with the theatrics. It needs no introduction. <laughs> it's the Simpsons. <laughs> it's the Simpsons. If you haven't heard of who the Simpsons are, you're listening to the wrong show. This holiday season, there will be a lot of Christmas shows. Ho, ho, ho. One more delivery and I'm done. <sighs> but one will change the face of television forever. Ho, ho, ho. ho. They're coming to save the 90s. When do we get paid? In their first full-length television debut. I hope you feel better, Santa. Oh, I will when Mrs. Claus's sisters get out of town. The Simpsons Christmas Special, Sunday, December 17th on Fox. I know it's, I know it's a conglomerate cartoon at this point, but it being true to myself, that is what, like, every Sunday night, it'd be like... I have to turn on Fox. Whatever was on before, I don't remember. I don't even remember. I'd be like, I have to see the intro and the couch. Like, I could not well, miss the couch animation. It's the longest the running Simpsons. show. I think it um, beat out what, like the Flintstones or something before that. Maybe that sounds right. And now the second runner is South Park. Um, but Simpsons would have to stop for the next like fifteen years for <laughs> South Park to take that right title to catch up. Um. Created by Matt Groening. I don't know what his re- career really was leading up to creating The Simpsons for the Tracy Ullman show, where it first appeared as shorts. P.S. Matt Groening called Ren and Stimpy the funniest cartoon on television. So there's that connection. Huh. <laughs> um, but The Simpsons, yeah, again, that's not for kids at all. Um, but 
my mom and dad were cool enough to let me watch it. Obviously, it's, you know, it turned out fine. Lots of us watch things we weren't supposed to, quote unquote. I remember. As long as our parents are good parents you know we turn out okay growing up my mom was adamant like you cannot watch beavis and butthead if she heard (laughs) anything that sounded remotely like it she would actually come into my room and change the channel on me turn the tv off whatever so i mean like beavis and butthead i understood simpsons i didn't get but i remember my cousin came over and he just had his daughter and she was probably like three or four at the time so she was old enough to watch tv but not old enough to watch certain things and when simpsons came on and it was like something innocent it was like it was like one of the syndicated episodes at like you know five or six o'clock at night and he came over and he was like no she can't watch that at all and i'm like what's wrong with the simpsons i never (laughs) thought of them as being a bad cartoon even then i remember as a kid my parents didn't watch the simpsons they were like it's this they lumped the simpsons the same in with stuff like south park and beavis and butthead of like you guys can't watch that the only thing for some reason we would watch together is the treehouse of horrors and then years later like i never grew up with the simpsons other than treehouse of horrors because my parents wouldn't really let us watch it and then i kind of lost interest because it was like seven seasons in eight seasons in before i started having my own like control over it and then I went back and I watched like the first couple seasons and I'm like, there's really not anything that bad in any of this. It's like Marge versus the monorail. It's funny stuff. Like there's nothing, there's a lot of clever writing. There's nothing that's like offensive or terrible. So, I mean, granted as time went on, like sure, things might've changed here and there as the audiences changed, but I feel like the first several seasons, there really wasn't anything terribly offensive in it for a kid to watch. Other no, than it's like- scratchy. It's like PG-13, really. Yeah. Um, you know, worse than like, go see kids see Guardians of the Galaxy. It's like the same level of stuff. I mean, they're probably doing a lot more social satire and commentary, but it's like kids kids don't understand that part. They're just laughing at the slapstick Homer falling down and like all that. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that's a lot of what I laughed at too, but I don't know, just the I don't know, it just really endeared itself to me. My dad would laugh, I would laugh. Again, it was another shared experience, memory for me growing up. But it's still, like, seasons, like, three to seven. Like, I don't know what they call the golden era of Simpsons, but, like, every episode just, like, fires on all cylinders. Like, from that, they hit once they hit that stride. The first two seasons are a little rough, just, um, but once they find the voice and, like, the style, it's, like, some of the best television, not even just cartoons, just some of the best television ever made in my opinion and they uh super i would never consider that like wouldn't have considered getting figures super seven is a company that makes a lot of stuff they're digging heavy in nostalgia they make playmates based turtles figures like they kind of look like the playmates figures that came out in 88 except they're like upgraded and look modern but just still have the 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 kind of like design sense based in the 80s and they just started releasing Simpsons figures, and I'm not really buying into them, but they just released their Wave 2, which features Bartman, Krusty the Clown, and Duffman. And I'm like, I think I can't resist getting Duffman. I think I, <sighs> Duffman, oh yeah. That's Duffman thrusting in the direction of the problem. Yeah, the Simpsons, like when I go to Universal, like I want to spend the most time in the Simpsons land. Like that's like, I don't know, it's so fun to me still i still haven't gone on the ride yet it's it's pretty good it's pretty good just being in the land and going to like moe's and the bumblebees like taco stand (laughs) bumblebee guys taco stand there's it's 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 cool how they they took the style and comedy sense of the show and made it work in like a theme park sense like the jokes it feels like the comedy matches the just the construction of everything and the did you like their rendition what, what of the Flaming Mo? Well, it's called a Flaming Mo. It's called the Flaming Mo. That's right, a Flaming Mo. My name is Mo, and I invented it. That's why it's called a Flaming Mo. What? What are you looking at, Homer? It's a Flaming Mo. I'm Mo. Yeah, it was good. I think. What did he say? Ah, uh, what was in it? Cough syrup or I something. Forget... <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just Nyquil. Yeah. Um, he said Duff. I think it was just like Stella Artois. I think. The guy, the bartender's like, it's Stella Artois. 
I don't know if that's true or not. I had a mo. I don't remember what was in it, but it was cool. They get they give like a souvenir glass that I think they put dry ice in it. That's what made it flame, quote unquote, like bubbles up. Yes, dry ice is safer than fire. I mean, it goes under the cup, like it like bubbles. Yeah. Up. <laughs> there was there was something that they do, but yeah, I'd be I'd be didn't I'd be lying if I didn't say Simpsons. I think was the most impactful just cartoon from my childhood. Yeah, it includes cough syrup. That's what it is. <laughs> I decided to mix the little bits that were left in every liquor bottle. In my haste, I had grabbed a bottle of the kids' cough syrup. It passed the first test. I didn't go blind. I don't know the scientific explanation, but fire made it good. Whoa, sounds like one hell of a drink. <laughs> Too many things to pull from from The Simpsons, but... The goggles, they do nothing. <laughs> I, it is I like feel wearing like nothing at all. <laughs> any of the first, all. like, I don't know, ten seasons, now that I've gone back and watched them now, I can just put it on shuffle, and any of those are solid for the most part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't yeah, into it were... as a kid too much. I got into Futurama pretty heavy, and that's also by the same um, writing crew. Yeah, but I would say just there were a few just as good big. There's a few big Simpson episodes I did remember watching, like um, Who Killed Mr. Burns. <laughs> yeah, that old saga, and that was a pretty pretty big deal around the time when that was premiering. And I was watching The Simpsons a little bit at that time. But I think that's really the most exposure I had. I had the pilot episode on VHS for whatever reason. And it was it's practically a Christmas thing. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember. It was uh, was it Santa's Litter, Little Helper. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And I had yeah, that on VHS. And I never understood why, but I still have it. I think the later episodes that I've seen, I are still, like, for the most part, here and they're funny, but I think I like them less because it's the same problem I have with a lot of series, is over time, writers seem to take certain aspects of characters and distill them down until that's all their personality. Because I feel like watching early on, Homer is, like, he's not a bright guy, but he's also not, like, an absolute, complete buffoon all the time. <laughs> And it's, he still cares about his family. Like he still tries here and there. And then I feel like over time, it kind of just distilled down to Homer dumb and Homer hates Bart and that's it. Um, which is, I, I Bart. yeah, die, Bart, die. It's German. It's the Bart, the. Why you little. <laughs> <laughs> I like when him and Bart go to the ticket window for, or go to the post office and. Homer's posing as Mr. Burns. He's like, hello, I'm Mr. Burns. I think you have a package for me. Oh, uh, what's your first name? I don't know. <laughs> he just turns around <laughs> walks away. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. There's too many, stuff. too many moments to pull. <laughs> so very good pick, all of you. It's Cartoons, all of these. These are the fight. specific episodes that make me nostalgic. Yeah, there's a. So I will probably be. I started writing into that same document I had on my notes for when we follow up on this episode and revisit it to include more. Yeah. Because even in the span of. I only wrote in it for like a couple minutes, but I already wrote down like six more shows I could possibly pick from. I kind of so. want to find a YouTube playlist that's just. It probably exists, just like every cartoon's theme song ever and just like listen to it in the car. It would be a lot of fun. Do it. So it sounds like uh, listeners can expect a cartoons part two for rule of thirds at some point down the line. Cause I know I have about, like I sent it to you guys. I think I have like 27 honorable mentions that came to mind that I'm like, ah, it, they just need to be another episode. At the end of the episode, after the theme music, I'm going to read off all of mine and you can just put them all there. <laughs> just run them by like uh, <laughs> an old mix CD that you would see on the commercials. Now that's what I call childhood cartoons. Volume one. Twenty seven. <laughs> hey, oh, hey, that's the first thing that came to mind. 
So, okay, gang. So that wraps up another episode of Rule of Thirds, and we'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our favorite childhood cartoons. As always, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or shoot an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three would be, or if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss. That's it for us. So for Nick and Dean, this is Tim. Have a great week and catch us next on Screen Refresh, the first Monday of the month. (laughs) 